Morning, everyone. Uh, Transportation Committee will uh, will come to order. Today is Wednesday, January 18th, 2017. And uh, we have on deck this morning uh, an overview uh, by MnDOT. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Commissioner Zelli to the table. Uh, what, what I'm going to do, Commissioner Zelli, this morning is we've got about an hour and a half. And so what I'd like to do is, is ask you to present your uh, overview in about 45 minutes, which is half of the time. And I will ask members to withhold their questions until you have fully pre presented. And then that will give our members an opportunity to ask you whatever questions happen to be on their, on their mind. Is that... That's correct. Uh, you understand, yep. Commissioner? Okay. Uh, with that very brief uh, overview, uh, Commissioner Zelli, please identify yourself for the tape and proceed. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I am Charlie Zelli, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation. It'll be a great honor to uh, present an overview of our transportation system, uh, how it's managed, how it's funded. Uh, and uh, as uh, the chairman has noted, uh, I will proceed uh, with some dispatch over a lot of complicated material. Most of uh, this uh, may uh, and probably is not new to uh, most of you, uh, but I think it's a good grounding in uh, the facts. Uh, and um, know that uh, four years ago, I presented before this committee on my second day on the job, and all of you knew more than I did about uh, what I was overviewing, and uh, that still might be the case, but I'm still going to take a shot at it, and I do like and look forward to the opportunity to um, answer uh, questions uh, as uh, after we kind of go over the, the main overview. Uh, you know, for those who um, are not familiar with the state history, there was a lot of different agencies associated with what is now MnDOT. Uh, there was, of course, the highway department, which goes back to dirt roads, but there was also aviation, uh, uh, planning processes, um, public service department, and all those were combined in the 70s to be one uh, department. And so our purpose is not just to have roads and highways. Uh, we have um, all the modes, waterways, aeronautics, public transit throughout the greater Minnesota, uh, we regulate, we have regulatory role over motor carriers. Um, and really, uh, our purpose is to not just build, but to manage a safe and a multimodal uh, transportation system. We are actually guided by a vision which is really helpful because often uh, we have been understood as being just, uh, 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 you know, the, the agency that maintains all the concrete and the bridges. Uh, we uh, often uh, have to remind ourselves that the uh, actual purpose of our agency is to help enhance uh, and in our vision it's well described as to maximize uh, the health of people, the environment, and our economy. Uh, that isn't a phrase that was just made up by those of us in the agency. It was from uh, a series of surveys, focus groups, and outreach to Minnesotans about what do they care about most when it comes to transportation. And it's actually all the benefits that we care about most deeply as Minnesotans for what transportation really helps provide, whether it's clean air, whether it's access to jobs, to uh, education, to maintaining the quality of life that that we really enjoy. And we realize to uh, have the mission to manage and maintain it in an efficient way um, is really critical and, of course, um, makes a huge difference. We are guided by values. Um, these are not just words on the wall. We have a number of programs that really are guided in part by our commitment to safety, excellence, service, integrity, and accountability. We'll get into that in a minute. But, of course, also diversity and inclusion. Diversity inclusion, not just because it's a governor or a commissioner or, uh, idea or one that we all think is, uh, would be nice. It is actually uh, uh, integral because our future workforce, our future contractor workforce, uh, we really need to represent the citizens of Minnesota. And if we're not uh, evolving our culture, we won't have a workforce uh, and we won't be able to uh, be able to uh, interact with the customers of, the, of, uh, of our state uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. 
So uh, again, getting into the overview, we are divided into eight regional areas uh, throughout the state. I think all of you may be very familiar with your own districts. Uh, the metro being the largest one uh, in terms of dollars, uh, but it uh, is also um, uh, perhaps represents maybe half of the funding uh, roughly in terms of maintenance and capital projects, but, but uh, by no means dominates because we have very special needs in each of our uh, districts throughout, throughout the state. Uh, just a quick overview about our organization. Uh, I won't go through every little box here, um, but I will say I have a pretty uh, strong leadership team. Uh, when I came to the agency, there were about 17 people reporting to commissioner. Uh, now there are five and very uh, uh, strong uh, uh, leaders uh, uh, who represent our kind of executive leadership team, two uh, deputy uh, commissioners, uh, Tracy Hatch, who's our chief financial officer and our chief operating officer, is actually here with us today. Um, and uh, uh, to me, it was important that we have a, a, finance, uh, a finance officer be uh, one of the uh, prime leaders of our agency, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, our chief engineer, Sue Mulvihill, whose, organi whose uh, different organizations is really the, probably the bulk of the employees, the district engineers, the operations, uh, our uh, technical and uh, engineering uh, services, as well as uh, the state aid uh, uh, system. Uh, we have uh, what I call three staff uh, uh, leaders who report directly to me. Uh, one, our chief counsel, uh, who uh, not only manages our, our legal team, but really is in charge of ensuring we have uh, compliance and manages our civil rights uh, office. Of course, there is a strong dotted line from the head of our Office of Civil Rights directly to me, uh, as is our Office of uh, Equity and Diversity, um, who also has a strong uh, dotted line, direct access uh, to me as well. Uh, Eric Davis, who's our uh, chief of staff, manages a lot of our outreach, uh, public engagement processes, as well as our, our major uh, diversity and inclusion uh, efforts. And then Sean Ron, who is uh, no stranger to the Capitol, is our assistant commissioner of policy, who manages both our policy activities and our uh, uh, government relations. Uh, we have, as I said, a, a wide range of uh, services. Uh, we are managing more than just roads and bridges, but when you think about roads and bridges, they're not inert objects. They actually are continuing to be uh, managed on a daily basis, and if you're around this weekend, you certainly saw a lot of our trucks. Um, they are also maintenance workers. They are, uh, we have uh, planners, uh, we have uh, a strong uh, kind of a seamless process for uh, both planning, building, and maintaining uh, these systems. Uh, we have a strong relationship with our county and municipal engineers uh, through the local road state aid programs. And then our multimodal uh, systems, um, that is uh, a separate divisions for aeronautics. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, certainly um, transit throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, and uh, what is often um, uh, uh, not, under, not uh, appreciated is that we actually manage the armor system, the state's emergency uh, communication, electronic communications uh, system, all the towers that the, you, the legislature, have um, authorized uh, throughout, uh, throughout the state. So I'll just give you a sense of the scale of our system, and, and many of you know this, we have a very robust uh, roadway network in the state of Minnesota. 12,000 miles of trunk highways, approximately, uh, that uh, some of them are actually in the Constitution um, uh, and uh, are really kind of every part of the state, which includes uh, our interstate uh, system. But if you add the municipal uh, state aid streets, there's an additional uh, 37 uh, 100 uh, miles. That is not all of the uh, city streets. There's m m many uh, streets uh, in the municipal systems that are not part of the state aid, meaning they're not part of the formula for funding, um, but are important uh, parts of our system. 
And then if we add in all the county roads and the county state aid system, uh, that's an additional roughly 31,000 miles uh, of roads. So that is actually a bulk of the county road system. And if you're close to your district and you'll speak to your local uh, county engineers and uh, our own district engineers, you'll know that some of these county roads uh, are very uh, robust conduits uh, for travel within and among uh, uh, our, our, our cities. So if we uh, look at township roads, uh, these are uh, also... Uh, Excuse me, Commissioner. Uh, Senator, the, what the plan is, uh, Senator Dibble, is, is we're going to allow the Commissioner to proceed with his presentation for about half of the time and then the, the, the second half of the committee hearing time will be devoted to, to allow you to ask whatever questions you wish. <laughs> Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, I will uh, uh, keep moving along quickly, and uh, we can always go back and uh, go over uh, some subjects if you wish. Uh, as you can see, township roads, 55,000, quite a bit more. So if you take it in its entirety, 143,000, 144,000 uh, miles of roads represents the fifth largest system in the United States. Uh, maybe it's our agriculture background, maybe it's we love roads, but we do have a very uh, robust uh, roadway system. And of course, uh, there's different components to that system. Uh, when you think about the amount of uh, traffic, uh, 33 billion of the 59 billion is on our trunk highway systems. There's, uh, that's the bulk of the actual vehicle miles. Uh, we have roughly 20,000 uh, bridges in the state of Minnesota, but uh, roughly a little less than 5,000 uh, actually carry or cross a trunk highway. So we're very engaged in maintaining a uh, smaller percentage of those, um, but we inspect all bridges. We have 135 airports in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we, of course, all know about the M the MAC system, uh, but uh, there are very uh, 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 very r uh, comprehensive network of, of airports, which are kind of a lifeblood for communities and for uh, greater Minnesota businesses. Nine of those airports actually have commercial passenger service. Uh, some of them, not all of them, supported by uh, essential uh, air service, uh, federal funds. Uh, and of course, the MAC system is, encompasses more than just the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. It's uh, the relief airports in the metro uh, area. Uh, we have, uh, very lucky in Minnesota, we have a deep water port in Duluth. We have very strong river ports. That makes it a uh, very uh, important part of our freight connectivity to the rest of the world. Uh, we actually, uh, when you think of uh, the Port of Duluth on one side of the Great Lakes systems and St. Lawrence Seaway on the other, um, if you look at a lot of the French uh, names of our streets in Duluth and in Minnesota, it goes back to the, uh, the, uh, the fur trade and the, uh, and the French voyageurs where uh, an initial trade came through this, the Great Lakes um, uh, for our region. And, and continues to this day. We have a very robust uh, rail network in the state of Minnesota. We have 19 railroads. That includes four class ones, but quite a few uh, uh, short line railroads, which are, of course, the really important connection for our Minnesota manufacturers and ag agribusinesses in, in greater Minnesota. Uh, I mentioned greater Minnesota transit. Uh, we have, we have actually have a transit system in uh, every uh, uh, county in the state of Minnesota. Um, uh, 12 uh, million uh, of, uh, transit trips, um, and that represents kind of 47 public bus systems. We have been working at making those systems more efficient, actually combining a few of them to, to with the ultimate goal of kind of creating greater access, greater uh, service territories. Uh, we have bicycle and pedestrian facilities uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. We actually uh, have two U.S. bike routes, which is not every state has a U.S. bike route, but we had one along the Mississippi River Trail from Lake Itasca uh, to the uh, southeastern part of the state. But we are just opening now 
a bike uh, route from St. Paul to Canada. And uh, we'll actually be celebrating that uh, more uh, in, in May. Um, so we've been really proud of the fact that we've uh, been uh, a uh, bike-friendly uh, uh, state. And again, that goes beyond the metro area. Freight and uh, 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 rail and truck traffic is uh, a, a real area of focus. It is clearly an area which is uh, going to be going to see continuing increases. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, something I want to get into in a minute in terms of our challenges, but uh, uh, it's an area that we really are thinking more carefully about. There are 850 uh, bridges that will require a significant work um, up ahead uh, in, the next, uh, in the next 10 years. And uh, all that is anticipating uh, ad additional uh, population coming to our state. Uh, we often talk about the sh funding shortfall for our state highway and bridge system. That's the 12,000 miles uh, that we maintain as an agency. But often lost on the conversation, and, but well, well known to all of you, is the lack of funding for the local road systems. Our nearest estimate has been that that gap is roughly uh, $18 uh, uh, billion, dollars, again, over uh, 20 years. So we've been identifying and trying to be more explicit about the projects and the need that is going uh, currently uh, unfunded. Uh, we, uh, and this is something you'll hear me say on every street corner, that 50% uh, of our state highway pavements are over uh, 50 years old, uh, and 20% uh, actually, um, uh, they actually have less than three years of useful life. Now, of course, we've had many roadways that have gone beyond useful life, and we keep them going by filling potholes or somehow uh, 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 keeping them going. Uh, but uh, we are clearly, and I'll get into a minute, uh, uh, facing a funding shortfall. 40% um, of our bridges are over 40 years old. You know, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, where some of us are again a little older, uh, don't think that seems like that long ago when we were opening up interstates and building bridges, uh, but they were never intended to last more than 40 years. We're building bridges now that will generally last 100 years. So we've, we've gotten smarter about our materials, our design. Uh, but nonetheless, we are facing a, a, a kind of a generational uh, bubble of aging uh, infrastructure. Uh, when we think about uh, operations, snow and ice is what uh, comes to mind. Uh, uh, and uh, you'll see this in this graph. Uh, uh, four years ago, we had actually undergone a really mild winter. Well, of course, that was the next two years. Uh, we spent a significant amount on snow and ice. We've had a philosophy of MnDOT of uh, whatever it takes, we, we get it done, because we know how essential uh, the uh, keeping mobility going throughout the winter is to Minnesota. We spent on one, uh, one weekend, I remember, in that 2014 winter, uh, we spent $20 million on one weekend. Uh, but that was also the same week where there were headlines of cars uh, being parked in the middle of Georgia uh, interstate, and they walked away, and they, they pretty much closed down their states for a whole week. Uh, nobody really talked about the fact that Monday morning we were just uh, we were going just uh, you know just like we usually do. So uh, we've done a good job of kind of uh, being taken for granted. But uh, of course, uh, my job is to say this doesn't just happen. Uh, we've been smart about uh, the amount of uh, investment we make in terms of maintaining our winter mobility. Uh, we've been doing that and actually using less salt. Just a side note: we're getting smarter with technology and 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 kind of prudent practices to make sure we're not overusing chloride, but use it when you need it. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes we get these uh, perfect storms like the snow, uh, the ice uh, thaw uh, and freeze cycles like you experienced the last two days where uh, I slid right down my driveway because uh, guess what? That slush just turned to ice overnight. So we continue to have our uh, challenges. But as you can see from this graph, the trend is going up. Um, the average is now uh, roughly uh, $80 million a year, uh, which is what we budget. But of course, um, that's uh, hard to keep track of. When we currently are spending more money than we have budgeted, it does take away from uh, summer maintenance, guardrail repair, um, and uh, some of the other work that we, signs that we need, need to do. Uh, just a bit about uh, the budgets. Uh, we have, uh, 
a uh, pretty uh, uh, diversified uh, source of funding. Uh, you know, people keep talking about the gas tax. Well, that's really important, but actually it, it provides 27% of our overall total budget. Uh, the budget, $3.3 billion on an annual basis, uh, is significant, but when you think about uh, where the funding goes, uh, it is also very diversified. The state road and bridge construction, the capital budget, is only 34% of that overall pie. Uh, that's often when we think of our, our capital budget that we announce every year that we're going to spend. And, and work on Minnesota roadways. Uh, quite a significant uh, percentage goes to our uh, state uh, aid program. So by formula, and actually, I'll get into this in a minute, really through the Constitution uh, uh, formulas, uh, uh, much of that funding comes to counties and, and, and cities. Um, but we also have uh, other, uh, other uh, spending categories, uh, including uh, some that goes to the public safety, some that goes to um, the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I would say roughly 8% uh, says category name, but that eight, that's lower right is uh, for operations and, and maintenance. Um, roughly 6% is uh, for debt service for previously issued trunk highway bonds. Um, that 6% is actually closer to 17% of our state resources dedicated to the trunk highway system. We have a debt service policy limit of 20%, no more than 20% of our state resources uh, toward the trunk highway system be dedicated to, to debt service, which has been a prudent and appropriate uh, kind of uh, uh, measure. We're creeping up to that debt limit um, under our current uh, forecasts. So here is the magical formula. It's not so magical. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, as I mentioned, is outlined in the Constitution. Uh, and uh, again, it really highlights uh, the uh, diversity of resources that are dedicated by the Constitution uh, to the highway and bridge system. Uh, gas taxes, tab fees, motor vehicle sales tax, and there's some other very uh, smaller uh, fees, but uh, most of it are those three sources. Um, curiously enough, the, the registration fees and the motor vehicle sales tax are now a bigger percentage than, uh, than, than the field taxes. Um, and then one 90, from the 95% of that fund, uh, is distributed to uh, roughly 62% to the Trunk Highway Fund, and then uh, the remaining uh, 40 to counties and municipalities. There is a 5% flexibility account, uh, which provides some sources, not much, uh, to uh, town roads and town bridges and, and some other grant programs. So as I mentioned, uh, there's a variety of, of highways in our state aid system. Uh, and undoubtedly, you are familiar uh, not just uh, with the state highway roads, but many of the county town roads uh, are the main streets of many communities. So here's a graph that I would want to call special attention to. Um, that is uh, not just our forecast, but our, uh, the actual funding of the state road construction program. Again, that's that capital investment. And in the spring, we re usually announce the lettings of what is being built during the construction season. Now, mind you, there's often 12 months to our construction season, but a bulk of our work starts in April or May and will continue uh, through the warm weather. Uh, we've had a, a variety of funding for our capital programs, and uh, those have now um, uh, been diminished or uh, been uh, been used up. Uh, the green part of the bar charts is the chunk highway bonds associated with uh, Chapter 152. That was from the 2008 legislature, which uh, authorized a significant investment in bridges. 
Um, we have a few more bridge projects to do this next year, and then that's uh, then that's uh, that'll be done. So our normal kind of uh, ongoing uh, sources of uh, of uh, revenue uh, is really now down to uh, 700 uh, million, uh, and will kind of be flat. Uh, and that uh, is after a number of years where we've been over a billion dollars, as you can see. Um, and uh, when we, we, I haven't used the word cliff, but I will use the word uh, lower amount <laughs> uh, by about 30, 40 percent, which is why I think we, we're now kind of really appreciate, everybody seems to be appreciating uh, the ongoing uh, revenue stream. Not just one-time money, but revenue stream is, uh, is, um, uh, has been hampered. So we think about gaps in funding. Um, this slide kind of shows what we have identified and uh, we believe is the shortfall over the next 10 years. We have a 50-year outlook, we have a 20-year uh, uh, plan, but the next 10 years it gets very real. And uh, we will be spending, under current funding, uh, approximately eight and a half billion dollars on preservation. Preservation is maintaining the pavements, the bridges in a good condition. It is not expanding. We do have funding for expanding. We will be um, actually uh, um, not be doing any more expanding of, that means new lanes, new interchanges after uh, 2023, just another, another uh, six years another five years, uh, and that's because uh, uh, to maintain the system we have is really taking all the available uh, resources we currently uh, can project. Uh, so when we've talked about $6 billion gap in the trunk highway system, $4 billion is uh, necessary for the preservation, maintain, maintenance of our system. An additional $2 billion that we see is really the strategic need for expansion. That's Often we've talked about corridors of commerce, I could talk about it in a minute, but that's areas where additional bottlenecks, uh, interchanges, lanes can really make a difference for mobility. And, and uh, $2 billion is not a uh, world-class solution. It is a, uh, what I would call a strategic kind of bare bones, and, and uh, I'll get into that um, in a second. So uh, this slide has been uh, traveling around the state, the perfect storm. Uh, many of you may have seen this, uh, uh, this slide, and I won't go into each uh, reason why we are suffering in transportation, uh, but as I mentioned, the gas tax is a smaller part of the system formula. It's because it really is pegged to consumption, not price, of our, of our, uh, of our needs. Um, and uh, as we think about uh, the aging infrastructure and, frankly, even the weather of our area, uh, we have uh, uh, we have challenges uh, ahead. Um, we would expect uh, uh, really in the next 10 years without additional uh, funding, uh, as much as 2,800 miles of our state roads uh, will be kind of at that zero uh, remaining service life uh, figure that I described. So here is our directional plan for 20 years. Now I'm going to step back to a 20-year plan. Um, we have $21 billion of, uh, of uh, investment that we, c that we are forecasting from current sources. Um, and uh, we have put together, uh, we just issued uh, the Minnesota uh, State Highway Investment uh, Plan. Uh, again, this is not a list of projects, but it is more uh, kind of directionally uh, where the categories of, of, uh, of investment can go. And you can see that big green portion is, uh, is pavements. Pavements is, uh, continues to be the single uh, category that uh, consumes uh, so much of our capital. Uh, we've done a good job with, uh, uh, in terms of uh, our outreach, a number of hearings, uh, listening sessions, uh, input from all parts of the state and all constituencies uh, into this planning process. Um, it is short. Uh, we see $39 billion worth of need to kind of keep uh, the system in its current state and to do that additional mobility that, that I think Minnesotans really will count on. Um, and to give you a sense, 
if we were to keep the pavements uh, in their current condition, in other words, the same percentage of, of, uh, of, uh, of drivability uh, that we have today, and we were to program the $21 billion to, in a sense, hold pavements uh, uh, constant, uh, it would absorb 80% uh, or 78% of, uh, of the budget over the next 20 years. And obviously, we have other needs besides pavements, not least of which is bridge condition. Uh, but it shows uh, where the challenge was in helping program um, our uh, next 20 years uh, because the reality is uh, the pavements under our current forecast uh, will suffer. Uh, all categories will suffer. I uh, was very chagrined when I, my friend and compatriot, uh, Secretary of Transportation of Wisconsin, uh, gave this same presentation about the future of Wisconsin and uh, said that under uh, the governor's uh, from Wisconsin's plan uh, that the conditions are going to erode. Um, I'm, I'm uh, not being bold to actually state out the facts uh, because uh, Governor Dayton, fortunately, has been very uh, uh, forthright and has encouraged me to uh, be, uh, be uh, very transparent. Uh, but Go uh, Secretary Gottlieb was relieved of his duties uh, last week, so he is actually not the uh, he's not the secretary in Wisconsin anymore. And just kind of say that uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, I've, I feel very fortunate. In Minnesota, we do have a tradition of let's let's just kind of say what the facts are. We can all discuss how we deal with them, but uh, but the facts are what are 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 what they are. Um, we do have some. Uh, Clearly, some uh, some funding choices, uh, and the reason that we uh, have been consistent with that six billion dollars uh, has been um, uh, in new revenue uh, required to kind of be economically uh, competitive and to keep the system in good shape um, because it has real results. Uh, if we don't make the funding, uh, you can see we will have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 re deteriorating bridges, uh, railroads. Um, uh, uh, but uh, if we do have it, um, we will be able to do a number of things, of course, keeping the system in good repair, but also uh, uh, expanding in certain areas. And, and when you think about the Corridors of Commerce program, uh, which was instituted about four years ago by the legislature, it's allowed us to kind of take uh, projects that weren't part of our normal program and to provide for some uh, mobility and expansion that have had significant uh, positive impacts, uh, we, we know, uh, in the state's uh, economy, both from attracting businesses and helping, uh, I think, commuters and, uh, and, and access. It, not just congestions, it's helped uh, with some vital freight corridors. Um, it has uh, offered some interchanges that otherwise uh, wouldn't have uh, been able to be built. Um, and of course, safety, which is paramount and one of our top top criteria, uh, we've been able to make more safety investments uh, like in uh, uh, two lane separations. Uh, when you look at pavement conditions, I, you can kind of see this is more of a, of a, of a kind of an overview of uh, what a bad road looks like. Uh, I think most everybody has their own um, uh, stories, but uh, under our uh, current funding level, just to show that most of the roads, even roads that look pretty good today, in 15 years they'll they will look like this. Likewise with bridges, um, here's uh, kind of a before and after of. Uh, or not a before and after, I'm sorry, these are both uh, bridges that need to be repaired. Um, you know, when you think about bridge uh, deteriorations, um, it does happen over time. What our goal is to be able to refurbish a bridge at the right time, to be able to extend the asset life as in a, as efficient a way as possible. If we uh, just wait until it gets too deteriorated, then we have to just replace the whole bridge, which is much more expensive. So this graph shows kind of our idea model of being able to uh, refurbish a bridge at that right time and, and, the, and to save state funds by extending that life so the time you do have to replace a bridge, um, it's done uh, uh, much later. Uh, likewise, we inspect bridges every year. We wash bridges from the salt. And uh, when we find something, and this happens, 
uh, we actually have to go in there and repair it. That sometimes that's grinding the iron down. It's sometimes uh, filling in concrete. Uh, sometimes it's the scouring happening underneath uh, uh, the, uh, the the bridge. When you think about uh, Chapter 152, I mentioned uh, the amount of investment that we've made in bridges. This just shows what we've done over the past four years. Uh, this would not have been able to be done without the uh, $2.1 billion of funding, uh, trunk highway bonds that have helped really kind of bring bridge condition uh, back. So I think our bridges are in pretty good shape. Everything, everything's safe now. Um, I can't say that entirely for some of the local bridges. We have a significant amount of uh, local bridges which are, uh, 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 which are structurally deficient. Uh, state bridges are in good shape. We will post bridges uh, to restrict the driving and even close them. Um, if when we need to, we actually closed I-35 near Duluth a couple of years ago because we found something that uh, we didn't have, we didn't expect. So part of our funding and part of the flexibility we require is to make sure we get resources when we find unanticipated deterioration. Uh, there are a number of bridges we're, that are in our plan over the next uh, 10 years, um, and uh, many of those uh, are in your districts. Uh, some uh, have been worked on in the past, but they require additional work. So uh, part of our ability to be uh, efficient uh, is to ensure that we, again, do the work at the right time and be, as I say, being an old bus guy, predictive maintenance is far cheaper than preventive maintenance uh, that is far cheaper than just repairing something. So uh, we try to get smart about when to do the work to, uh, in anticipation. Uh, before it becomes uh, too much of a problem. Uh, as many of you know, uh, efficiency uh, and effectiveness have been uh, pretty much a focus for the agency over the past four years. Uh, I think we've done a great progress in both uh, performance measures and a way to um, really save funds and to make smart investments uh, to save uh, more money um, over the past, uh, the past number of years. We've been able to free up funds that have been applied to other projects. Also, we've been able to free up funds to help cover some areas which have been uh, over budget, uh, to be honest. Uh, you know, unanticipated costs, uh, costs caused by uh, weather. Um, uh, we don't limit it just to capital investments, uh, our operations and maintenance. Uh, for example, by having tow plow blades uh, behind snow trucks saves us buying additional snow trucks. We have been able to free up the capital investment from less snow trucks to put in some of the other capital uh, fleet investments that had been lacking. And so uh, some of this doesn't always show up uh, in line items, but it's ability for us to, again, to extend uh, the efficiency of, uh, of our operations. I uh, want to just mention uh, the FAST Act. Uh, I just ran into Congressman Nolan, who was a great honor uh, in the uh, lobby. Uh, our Minnesota delegation has been, uh, from across, of, of the entire state, has been uh, unified in helping advance infrastructure investments federally. The FAST Act does provide more funding for the state of Minnesota. And the most important thing is that we anticipate at least to be um, consistent funding. Um, uh, it has not fully been, all of it has been appropriated, it has been authorized. Uh, but the authorization alone provides as, uh, as much as 50 million more dollars uh, for the state of Minnesota. We have programmed that into our planning, so it's not uh, it's not it's not new money in terms of our plans, but it's money that really will make a difference. 20 uh, million of that is for our uh, freight network, and we've been uh, very fortunate to have uh, a more robust freight uh, uh, network and a freight uh, planning process. Uh, that is actually required under the FAST Act, but we've had it all along in Minnesota, so we're in good, we're good position with our freight advisory committees um, and, our, uh, and our study about uh, uh, how uh, both uh, highway and uh, rail and obviously uh, shipping, uh, all the modes kind of fit together for an overall uh, uh, freight outlook. Uh, the, uh, the uh, FAST Act does provide for uh, some rail investments. Uh, most of that is the East Coast, uh, but some of that will actually uh, impact and help our, uh, 
our uh, both freight and passenger networks. Uh, there's no funding federally that I see coming for our passenger uh, plans, but we do have a passenger office at least ready should that uh, ever become a infrastructure stimulus in the in the future. Um, just a quick word on our planning process before I uh, reach the uh, limit of our time for me to present. But uh, again, I talked about this 50-year vision. It really is a family of plans that comes down to a very operational uh, uh, level. Um, you might be best, most familiar with the uh, with the STEP, that's the, uh, the State uh, uh, Highway Investment Plan. Uh, that is uh, uh, really a series of projects, but it's a four-year outlook which is updated every year. So the one thing I'd say about a State Highway Investment Plan is that it continually is studied and it evolves. If we have additional funding from efficiencies, we're actually in a project that's several ready, we can move it up uh, to a, to a, a, a year or two, and, um, but generally the idea of actually having planned projects over time uh, really helps us to be efficient and to be smart about how we uh, deploy uh, our resources. Uh, I mentioned the uh, MinShIP, that's the 20 year plan, uh, which I discussed before, more policy direction. And just a word on our, uh, because people often ask how do we uh, select projects uh, I will say that it is a balance between our statewide experts, whether it be asset management, using performance measures, uh, our planners, uh, and then working with local districts. Local districts, engineers, through the various advisory committees, have great access to what is important to each uh, area. And we try to balance district plans with our state plans to make sure, in one sense, we're consistent in terms of our performance measures sharing expertise, but also being really in tune uh, with local needs and, and, and local knowledge. Um, that's likewise true in the metro area as, uh, and uh, where we work with the Met Council um, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, regional uh, uh, transportation advisory uh, groups. So that's my, I like to be on time and on budget being a bus guy, so uh, I'm within 30 seconds, and I'm ready for whatever questions you have, uh, knowing I probably glossed over a lot very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, you, you did a great job, and we, we really do appreciate it. Uh, I, I realize we put you on a fast track, but uh, at this point, uh, we will entertain questions from uh, various men, uh, members. Uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I was wondering if I could ask just a series of questions. They're, they're actually very small questions, just little points of fact, not extemporaneous, theoretical, solve the world's problems questions, <laughs> if I could. Uh, first of all, um, just, just to put into uh, context and perspective um, uh, on the, si the relative size, the, the series of slides you had on the, on the relative slide of our, of our roadway system, um, I think it's interesting to also know, and, and maybe you said this, and if I missed it, I for, uh, I, please forgive me, um, but back on slides 8, uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12, um, you know, the 12,000 miles that's attributable to the state-owned system, et cetera, um, do, you, do you have offhand the relative percentage of traffic that each of those systems bear? I, I have a rough, rough knowledge of that myself. I'm just asking for the benefit of the committee. Sure. Commissioner Zelli. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dibble, the uh, actual statistic is a few slides uh, back in terms of the, uh, or forward, in terms of the actual uh, 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 vehicle, uh, vehicle miles. It's on slide 13, uh, where 33 billion of the roughly 60 billion is on the trunk highway system. So I, I've always said it's, 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 it's more than 50%. I think this is closer to, you know, 54 percent. But it's, it is uh, most of the traffic, and then, and I'd also uh, point out much of the freight and the heavy traffic is on the on the state uh, system. Right. So the, even though it's a smaller percentage, uh, it's a great right. point to uh, that that is a really large share of the right. biggest right. share of the yeah, traffic. Point. Senator point. Dibble, you have a follow-up question? Yeah. The point the point being that with about five percent of the miles more than half of the of the traffic uh, is carried correct by the state owned system commissioner zelli yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator DeBola. It is why uh, we have a much higher standard and where uh, so much of the funds uh, really are there to preserve, maintain the system that takes the biggest uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of service. Right. So, Mr. Chair, um, just Senator a few more, Dick. if I could. Thanks. One more, and then we'll, we'll move on. Thank you. All right. Um, so, um, well, then I'll have to pick one here. <laughs> uh, so, on the... Um, on, on the debt service question, I think um, you show in the in the in the big pie chart, um, uh, debt service is responsible for uh, six percent of the overall expenditures uh, uh, made by the uh, agency. But but what is that relative to? Um, so I believe most of that debt service, or all of it, is our, our trunk highway funds. And, and so um, it's probably uh, just as useful to understand relative to the trunk highway fund itself, the 62% of the 95% that goes into the highway user tax distribution fund, what is the percent um, uh, out of the trunk highway fund that we expend in debt service? That, of course, gets to our debt limitations and some of our capacity to issue additional debt with our existing size of the fund. Commissioner Zelig. Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, when we look at the actual uh, debt service, uh, it is really an important point to know that trunk highway bonds are restricted to the trunk highway system, which is that roughly 12,000 miles, that 5% of all roadways. So it is a little confusing to see only 6% because it is uh, the funding that helps support that debt service is really the, the funding that is restricted to the trunk highway system. So um, if you think about our debt service uh, limit of 20%, uh, we uh, actually have, um, uh, we're not at 20%, we're below, and we anticipate to be, uh, I forget, somewhere between 17 and 18%, uh, but that the source of fundings is only those state funds uh, really dedicated to the trunk highway system, as you Point out, Senator, the 62 percent of the of the uh, state uh, sources. Thank Senator you. Dibble, did you have a follow-up question to this, or no? We? No, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Hello, Commissioner Zelli. Good to see you again. See you. Uh, my question has to do with slide 21 about the DNR transfers. Um, I notice on the other boxes there are specific road things, so DNR. A little bit different. So, can you give us a bigger breakdown of what's what's going on with the DNR transfers, Commissioner Zelli, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, good to see you. Uh, I don't have the exact figure. I can give it to you. Um, the uh, there is a, a uh, uh, some of the funds that go to the DNR, and I think the rationale in the past has been uh, that, uh, that there's fuel that actually is expended in state parks through either off-road vehicles or snowmobiles, um, and that maybe they are generating some of the funds for that use. I know that's part of the rationale, um, but I, I, I can't speak to the total history, and I can give you the exact amount. It is not, uh, is not uh, uh, you know, hugely significant, but it is, it is funds that come out of the formula. Senator Kiffmeyer, do you have a follow-up question? Well, my, my follow-up question, though, is, is um, a little bit off to the side. But on slide 35, there's the FAST Act, the federal dollars for freight. Have you applied for any of those grants planned to and any projects you can name that you've done that with? Uh, Commissioner Zelli. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, well, we have, and I, and I, in my haste, uh, I, I didn't mention that the grant programs, this roughly uh, $900 million per year uh, has been dedicated to those grant programs, and um, there's only been one round of funding. Uh, there's been a second where we've, we've applied for both, and we haven't heard uh, from the second, and I'm not sure in the next two days of this administration where we're going to hear, but uh, it is part of the Federal Highway consideration. We have uh, identified at least three. We're allowed up to three projects. We think there's three very competitive uh, projects that we have uh, advanced. One is for uh, 
the area uh, which we call the can of worms. I think it has an official name, but it is uh, really the access to the Duluth port. Uh, it is both a, uh, a freight, very important freight network, but involves uh, the livability of the area as well as the traffic mobility for residents. And it's a, and it's a project that had just not had enough funding to, to be able to, for us to address. Um, there's another project uh, in the uh, north uh, metro area, a uh, freight corridor along 35W that we think an additional capacity would make a significant difference. Um, we have uh, another uh, 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 project in uh, Moorhead to do some grade separations of, because of the uh, robust r rail traffic that has been uh, in part uh, impeding local traffic in the Fargo-Moorhead area. And, uh, but having said that, there are a number of projects, a uh, local project that scores well, but not up at the top uh, three at this point. Um, uh, I-94, uh, and, and uh, which we've certainly been writing letters of support. So there's been a number of applications, not just from the state, but from local governments that we've been very engaged with. Um, and uh, I should say that we've been very uh, specific about the scoring and to not make it, uh, you know, done in a side conversation. We've been very transparent about uh, what the particular return on investments, uh, other funding sources, uh, availability, not uh, just of other sources, but uh, of work of, uh, of project readiness to, to get it going. So, um, so clearly, there are many more projects, in just even in Minnesota, that uh, um, uh, that would be great projects. And to the extent that this program will continue, uh, I'm hopeful that Minnesota will see a share of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Zelli, for being here this morning. Um, question for you. Back in, I'm not sure, I know that I was in Japan at the time when the bridge fell here in Minneapolis, uh, and there was a listing that came out of the number of bridges that were in need of dire repair. And I know that you've, you've listed many bridges within that your presentation here of being worked on and working on, how many bridges are left? And are they, uh, because they were recognized at that time, are they still on a high priority list to get done? Or how do you take those into consideration? Because you've already said 40% of our bridges right now are over 40 years. So if I could get a list of those bridges and where they are in our priority list going forward, and I do have a follow up. Commissioner Zelli. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Anderson, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think when the bridge fell, and ironically it was from uh, a design flaw, but uh, the idea of having an interstate bridge fall in America captured everybody's imagination, especially in Minnesota. Uh, it may have been one of the, uh, one of the uh, points that urged us to invest uh, that two billion dollars toward bringing bridges, particularly those that were um, that didn't have redundant uh, design. Uh, they were fracture critical, meaning uh, one error could create the whole bridge to go down. And and we really identified those, uh, and so that's why that list of those bridges that were in critical shape uh, needed to be addressed. Uh, Bridges like the Lafayette Bridge, uh, which uh, you know, I heard rumors. I never talked to anybody who said, "Well, I know too much. I'm not driving on that bridge." But that bridge was much like the I-35 bridge, and and of course uh, now it's completely new and and redundant and and repaired. Um, um, so we've listed the bridges that were that were addressed. Uh, I will say that our bridge conditions are generally good shape now. Um, that they're safe. Uh, if they weren't safe, and we have a, probably a much more robust inspection program uh, in the state of Minnesota after that I-35 tragedy, uh, and uh, up to and including not just regular uh, spot inspections, but we have everything from drones checking areas that we've hardly been able to get to, um, and, and then uh, as well as more advanced methods of, of bridge condition. Um, having said that, bridges don't stay in good shape. We know that they erode over time. So when I say they're 40 bridges, 40% 40 over 40 years old, 
uh, it doesn't mean that those uh, suddenly become uh, weakened, but that over time uh, they will reach that state. And uh, I don't have a, we have a, uh, which I don't have with me, but we're happy to share what we call our Next 10 program that actually is more specific about projects, uh, many on bridges that we currently don't have identified in our, in our Next 10 funded program uh, that would be helpful. I don't have a list of bridges uh, with me today, but, uh, but I will want to uh, assure you that uh, we have, uh, uh, because of this Chapter 152 program, we've really identified those that at that time we knew needed to be replaced or, or significantly refurbished. The bridges that are on our list going forward are also ones that we know we have, we have to do. And, and, and my, one thing to keep in mind is bridges aren't just bridges that go over rivers or streams. The, uh, many of our bridges that are, uh, and many of those are local bridges, go over interstates or other highways or railways. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a number of, uh, of needs and, and I think that uh, we will be happy to share what we believe are anticipated uh, going forward, but uh, but I don't have a list of those big high profile ones like we did, you know, six years ago. Commissioner, I'm going to uh, just indicate you're a pretty popular guy. I've got a, a, a fairly long list of folks who want to ask you okay, a question. I'll... So if you could make your answers succinct, we'd really appreciate it. Okay. Senator Anderson, you had a follow up. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Chair. Uh, Mr. Zelli, I'm guessing that we have money coming from the federal government for these bridges that help in getting those uh, projects going. Uh, you mentioned that toward, toward the end, uh, the fast track and how many dollars were there. And so I'm guessing that, again, we've got federal dollars that are coming uh, for some of our other. But you also mentioned a 50-year vision for the state of Minnesota as far as the outer ring. And I was asked this at a uh, quarters of commerce or on I-94 uh, legislative panel uh, a couple weeks ago. What is the long range goal uh, for uh, relieving traffic? Uh, and I remember, I think, talking about this when Senator, uh, when Representative Liz Holberg was the chairman in the House about having a uh, outer ring outside of the 494, 694. Is that still in a, a part of your vision? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, that was a, a vision, uh, you know, some years ago. Uh, that was also an $80 billion vision. Uh, and I, to be really honest, uh, uh, that has been scaled to a point where to be competitive uh, and to be prudent, um, we have identified uh, the importance and the interrelationship of uh, corridor, transit corridor, and highway corridors to be working in, in conjunction with each other. So uh, our uh, min pass lanes that are underfunded but really could provide great capacity both for cars and for transit buses and others um, could really uh, be able to keep the metro uh, thriving without gridlock, um, without building a third ri a ring, which we've now determined to be cost prohibitive. Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, Commissioner. I have some questions that uh, I think I know the answer to, but I'd like to have the answer at a commissioner level. And the first one is, uh, um, how much or what percent of the gas tax and the license tabs goes for is diverted and goes for light rail? Second question for transit. Third question for bicycle trails. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, uh, that'd be a good Jeopardy question because uh, I've, uh, the, uh, the answer is uh, what is not funded with gas tax? Uh, uh, there actually is zero funding by the Constitution for transit from the Highway Trunk Fund and, uh, or even the state aid. So, uh, so no gas tax uh, or registration fee funds uh, goes to transit. So when I speak about uh, how we uh, manage it as a system, it is more about at the planning level and more about how uh, both roadways and uh, transit can uh, work together to be more efficient 
but they are funded separately. And uh, there are uh, bike uh, uh, lanes and planning as part of state highways, but only to the extent that um, uh, it has a great value added uh, 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 as part of the, the goals of the state highway, say going through a smaller town, and we think about ways to use the, the right of way efficiently. Senator Jensen. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zelli, just a real quick answer. And this is really more for talking points for a lot of my constituents. When we're just building a new uh, two-lane road in a county, Carver County, whatever, what is the difference between the bid price for approximately one linear mile versus one linear mile plus a detached bike walk path that's maybe six or eight feet or whatever you normally have. The question comes up is, why do we build roads anymore that don't have a bicycle walking path that's detached? And, and is it cost prohibitive or can you help me out there, please? Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, I think that uh, cost is always an issue no matter what we're doing. Um, uh, I think that uh, depends on the area, you know, uh, an urban, uh, mile of road, very different than a greater Minnesota mile of road, and what, it, what, how a bike lane or path uh, fits into with the overall, uh, you know, connectivity for, for bikes. You, we, we actually do believe strongly in a bicycle plan for the whole state, um, but part of that is to ensure that uh, we're not putting uh, people in danger. Um, and uh, oftentimes a strong, a, a, in a, in a case of a rural highway, a, a, a robust uh, shoulder, which is there for snow maintenance, safety, um, also can accommodate bikes. You know, so there's a, usually there's multiple uses, so it's hard to kind of say what the additional cost is. But for a for a particular uh, stretch through a small town, um, that might be part of an, a project which involves uh, sidewalk improvements paid by a local government, um, and a bike path isn't necessarily the state's responsibility. Senator Jensen. That question actually did ask for a number. Can you take a guess? Oh, um, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, Senator, I, unfortunately, I, uh, I can get back to you, and I'll get a number for you. I just don't, uh, I, I often am willing to make things up, but I, that would probably not be a good idea. In this case. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sen uh, Commissioner Zelli, uh, two questions. Um, the St. Croix Bridge Crossing seems to be a challenge. Uh, can you provide some information as far as how we've gotten to the point and what challenges we're seeing as well as uh, what's going to be done to complete that project? And the other question I have relates to Highway 12. Um, did you have input into the governor's bonding bill? Certainly there are a couple of transportation projects in there. Um, and do you have any information as to why the governor decided that a, a project that was almost unanimously uh, deemed important by the Senate last session was not included in the bonding bill? Commissioner. Sure, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, uh, uh, well, uh, the St. Croix crossing uh, is, as we all know, a very large project. Uh, it has uh, had uh, some uh, slowdowns early in the construction phase uh, over the over the river, uh, which was certainly in the press, and we've been open about the fact that our contractors were having some challenges. A uh, number of uh, challenges were out of their control, like the a uh, two uh, subcontractors, uh, the uh, folks who were making the uh, concrete forms. Uh, uh, down river, uh, had a, the owner died. They had to kind of re find a new manager and reconstitute that company. Uh, a DBE was undercapitalized in the steel work and they had challenges there. They had to step in and, and, uh, and uh, with their own new subcontractor. Um, and I think uh, at that time, there was a, uh, because of that and a tough winter, uh, it slowed the schedule. Uh, that uh, has since caught up significantly. The contractors, joint venture, put a lot of additional resources, brought in uh, big giant cranes from around the world to supplement their their hanger cranes that they uh, uh, their lifter cranes that they had had, and they brought in hanger cranes and 
And if you'd seen it over the past uh, 18 months, they really uh, started picking up the pace. And I'm really pleased to see that the bridge is, comp is actually, uh, you know, from bank to bank, pretty much the hardest part is done. It's really finishing work. Well, I call it finishing work. Our engineers will call it actually doing a lot of important work. But um, you can kind of, I have walked across. And uh, uh, so I think the risk of the schedule is a lot less than what it was before we anticipated to be done this year. Senator um, Osmick, do you have a follow-up? Nope, just the Highway 12 question. Senator Osmond. Uh Chair, uh, Senator Osmond, on the Mr. Highway 12, uh, we've made a great improvement in terms of putting in that median. We're pretty thrilled about that. We found money um, to get that done. Uh, we didn't wait uh, for an appropriation. We know that there's a lot of additional work. Some of it involves Hennepin County uh, and not just state uh, to actually get that interchange or intersection figured out. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, we see it as a... Uh, Obviously, something that would be uh, important to have, but uh, I can't speak to why it didn't meet the uh, governor's priority at this point. Um, we know we have a lot of local uh, interest in. We do have a local, uh, uh, you know, road and a local bridge category, which would be open to kind of a more of a grant scoring process. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here and for a very helpful presentation. Um, I was interested to see the statistic on slide 16 that freight, truck, and rail traffic is expected to increase by 30% by 2030. Um, it's the first time I've actually seen it quantified in that way, and I know that that comes on the heels of additional significant increases that we've seen in recent years. I bring this up to refer to an issue in my particular district that I also know is a case study for some of our challenges statewide, and so that's why I'm going to bring it up, because I know looking around this table, everybody has something in their district, and the same thing can be said for really every member of the Senate. Um, I'm referring to the interchange of I-94, 494, and 694. Um, and this, most of us, I think, drive through it if we ever go to Wisconsin or it points east, as does our freight. So when we talk about the port and when we talk about freight coming in from the west and they're coming across the northern side through Senator Kiffmeyer's district, they come through mine through that interchange and it is a tight little cloverleaf um, and 18-wheelers have a big problem with it and there's an awful lot of 18-wheelers that come through there. I'll also add just for in honor of Senator Limmer. Um, the stretch of 694 from 61 all the way down to 94 is still two lanes. So we, within the main 94 system, we still have a chunk that's two lane and that is exacerbates some of those problems. It is a public safety problem. It is a congestion problem. We have tons of traffic coming in from our neighbors to the east in Wisconsin for uh, rush hour and going back. Um, and then we have this freight uh, implication. My understanding now is that we're looking at about a $30 million Band-Aid to do some easements of lanes so that people can merge and get on and off more safely and we're going to, it's a geometric thing on the clover leaf to make it better for those 18-wheelers. Um, but people keep asking, what is it going to take to fix this? And the answers I keep getting when I speak to people in your department and elsewhere um, there are so many more serious problems. And that as bad as this is, and as worse as it's going to be, it is nowhere near the horizon to take care of these problems because our budget is so <laughs> inadequate to deal with it. We have to deal with much more serious issues in other parts of the metro and in other parts of the state. So as bad as this one is, and as important as it is, and as much as these problems are gonna get added to, can you speak to the challenge of having to just, frankly, for a 20-year period, ignore something as significant as this and that we all are dealing with in our districts around the state. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, you uh, gave a great testimony, and uh, I think you really said it. Uh, we are undercapitalized in terms of what is efficient and what is prudent, and uh, we end up with high return fixes, which means it's 30 million, not 100 million. Um, we find that a lot of freight and trucks are bypassing the central cities, so they're going right through your neighborhood and, and going around the, uh, the 694 uh, loop going north. And uh, it, that is a, it probably will get more congested. 
Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Zelli. Excuse me, Senator Hall, I just wanted to, to mention one thing. Uh, I made a promise to the commissioner that we'd get him out of here at five minutes to 12. He has another commitment. So I would ask members to keep that in mind. And we have a number of uh, folks that still want to ask questions. So just keep it in mind. Mr. Senator Chair, Hall. It, it, was that because I was speaking next? Uh, no, uh, it, it is right. not, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Zelli, uh, I, I'm a new guy on the uh, committee here, and this is what I'm hearing from you, and I think it goes along with Senator Kent's uh, thought, and that is um, I think we would all have the goal that we want to maintain everything we have responsibly before we expand. Um, you know, whether it's pavement, light rail, bike trails, before we expand, we need the essentials taken care of. And I don't see that that's what's happening. I mean, if we talk about a $6 billion need, I mean, that's way beyond us, and we're not living within our budget. So is it that we're not um, putting those into the um, framework of our budget, that this is what we're going to need? And, and what's our problem? Commissioner. Um, Chair, uh, Senator, uh, well, thank you for having that plain question. Uh, uh, you know, Governor asked me to consider running this agency like my own business. Yeah. And uh, I have had experiences in an asset-intensive business, not like this, but a bunch of buses that do well, and then they need refurbishment, and then eventually buses need to be put to bed and traded in for, for a new one. Um, and I think uh, the hardest thing for a business is to be undercapitalized, to not have the resources to maintain, um, to maintain a, a bus system. If, if, if my bus company didn't replenish its capital assets, um, we'd be out of business. So we are undercapitalized. There's just no question. Because sometimes investing, in, even in capacity, has much higher returns, much much more prudent for taxpayers than it is trying to um, uh, not make the investments that actually have that incredibly important uh, financial and quantifiable return. And our returns can be measured not just in savings of future costs, but also the mobility that affects uh, the industry, the access to jobs, access to education. So um, it's a complicated system, and we know that like running my bus company, I occasionally, uh, you know, raise uh, ticket prices because people are willing to pay because they get a value for, you know, taking the bus. So I, I think of it as how do you be as smart as possible, not just about cutting a cost, but by investing wisely and keeping the cost as efficient as possible. And I think that system here we have is uh, our, our actual capital assets are getting to a point where it's costing us more to fill the potholes than it is to kind of do it right and to make those investments at the, at the right time. I'm going to go to Senator Senjum at this point. I'd indicate Senator Senjum, Senator French, you've both got questions. Senator Carlson, I will try to get back to you if we have time. Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Yeah, you can answer this question fairly briefly. I'm looking at your org chart, uh, page 3. Uh, and the, the question is, uh, MnDOT lets a lot of bids all over the state. And in, in terms of, of evaluating those bids and best value and whatever it is, are, are they, does that evaluation take, taken, uh, and done at the central office or, or is it done individually within district offices? Uh, I'm just thinking about the consistency of how, how best value is interpreted and, and applied to bids. Commissioner. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, uh, my uh, sense is that we it is a collaboration. The district office is very much involved, but particularly when it comes to best value or any kind of alternative contracting, uh, we have experts uh, within our central office, uh, both in finance and in, in, in our engineering divisions, who are very much engaged in ensuring that we have a, you know, a consistency in, in terms of our practice. So, Mr. Chair, just follow up. So, so it is Senator collaborative Sanger. with the district office, then? That, Commissioner. Yes, that, that's the material that Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Zelli. I think I can pose a question that has a one-word answer. 
Um, as everybody on the committee knows, highway safety is a priority. We've reduced the number of fatalities on Minnesota roadways um, per passenger mile dramatically since 1970. Uh, the hard part for us is that the people whose lives are saved don't know that their lives are saved, so they don't call you because they didn't get a call at the two in the morning. My question is simple, Commissioner. Can you assure everybody on this committee that safety remains the same level of priority as it always has as we go forward? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, yes. Senator it, it, Carlson. Engineering, education. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Uh, uh, enforcement, all really, really critical. And new technologies like high-tension cable medians are save lives uh, uh, a lot, and uh, uh, we hear about it. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Carlson, I'm going to call on you, Senator, and just indicate Senator Westrom does have a question also. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, yeah, Commissioner. I have a question that came up uh, probably a year and a half, two years ago, um, and it relates to the 35W bridge collapse uh, that came down on August 1st of 2007. And within about uh, three to five days, I had pulled off of the MnDOT website all of the inspection reports going back as far as they existed. Uh, now, you can't get those. The public is not able to get those. I think they're behind a, a login, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've tried to go in there a couple of times, and I've, it's really ne I've neglected contacting the office to find out how that can be made uh, accessible again. Uh, it's not that I'm nosy, it's just that I'm an engineer and I like to look at things like that. And I learned a lot, because uh, I pulled off, out the 35W uh, ones, I pulled out the, uh, uh, and the bridge list too, by the way, uh, Senator Anderson. Uh, and. Uh, the um, Lafayette as well as the Winona Bridge later on and looked at exactly what the inspectors were finding and it made me both comfortable and uncomfortable with our bridge program and it, it helped uh, to support more, uh, more, ins more inspection and some of the remediation that we needed to do. So I, I'd really like to have those available if possible. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, I will uh, I'll inquire as to what the status of our disclosure is. Uh, uh, I don't really have an answer for you, but we can get back to you. I, I do know that after the I-35 bridge collapse, uh, there is, a, as you can imagine, uh, uh, a very complicated set of uh, litigation uh, that involved uh, a lot of parties, and then including the ultimate uh, studies that showed that it uh, had a number of reasons why that happened at, on that day, and um, and I so I know that even today there's a number of uh, of uh, information uh, that has been uh, sequestered for that purpose. I don't know if that's the reason, but um, uh, I will, we'll find out. I, I do think transparency in terms of what we're doing, we try to get as much on the website as as possible. Senator Westrom, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner. Um, Thanks, thanks for coming here, and uh, I do want to thank you uh, four years later, or three years later, for us uh, working out the speed limit increase to 60 miles an hour, so okay. don't uh, think we forgot about that. Uh, constituents in my area appreciate it and uh, are frustrated when they're still on the roads that are 55, but uh, that's not my question. Um, we talk about the funding issue, and uh, we've kind of been bottled up for a few years uh, with some reforms, one of them being uh, allowing uh, contractors to uh, haul weights that we allow other uh, industries to haul on our roads, uh, something more about 88 or 90,000 if they have a third axle on their trailer. And it seems like that's been resisted, yet uh, there's savings that uh, it would it would it would result in the, the bids that they give us uh, according to their information. Um, just interested in your perspective or uh, willingness to uh, look at some of those reforms, uh, with or without new dollars uh, injected into the current gas tax. Um, it struck me all the time that without making efficiency reforms, it it doesn't usually help to raise the ticket price uh, when you've got uh, real uh, other other areas of, of real uh, savings opportunities uh, 
at the same time or, or, or first. And so I'd just like to have you address that briefly. Commissioner. Uh, Chair and Senator Westrom, thank you. I, I um, uh, you know, I really defer to our safety and our engineering experts. Uh, I certainly have had a, a philosophy of flexibility and, and base uh, good decisions on facts. Uh, I think in this case, the facts, there's some contradictory facts. Uh, there's uh, some studies that show that there's great efficiency and that with additional axle, uh, you know, maybe the weight per axle what really matters. Uh, except then we have our bridge engineers saying, you know, not so fast, and then uh, state patrol and some uh, local uh, sheriffs in the counties uh, have strong opinions uh, saying that there's a, there's a major safety uh, risk with, with heavy vehicles. So um, I, I think it's complicated. It's been complicated politically. It's complicated in terms of the, the facts. Uh, I think uh, we were relying uh, for a while on a federal highway study that would kind of give more guidance so there would be consistency among states. And uh, I think that study came out without any greater clarity than was there before. So um, I think it certainly is one that should continue and is going to be continuing to be part of the uh, part of the, uh, the conversation uh, here. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly offer our experts to the extent we can help, you know, kind of uh, give you a better sense of what the, you know, what the what facts we do know uh, are on that, but it, but I have learned that it's not quite as it's not quite as clear uh, one way or the other as I, I initially had, I had thought. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to express our appreciation for you coming in today and and uh, answering the questions that have been put to you as best you can. And uh, I wish you a safe journey on wherever it is that you're going in a hurry. Uh, I'm going to Roseville. I'm going to drive safely, but uh, I really appreciate uh, a the timing and, and also your wonderful questions. And I, myself, and our department, we really do stand as wonderful, uh, willing partners and of both information policy ideas. Whatever question you have, uh, it's a great honor to uh, serve you and the and the people of Minnesota. So thank, thank you, Commissioner. One announcement before we adjourn: Senator Dibble has requested that I indicate that. You know, he had a number of questions that he feels uh, will, all, in all likelihood, be addressed at the Transportation Alliance uh, meeting that's in the basement, at, uh, 8:30, in the Senate office building tomorrow morning. If folks want to go to it, I just wanted to make that announcement. I have just been corrected. It's in the state office building. Um, and uh, but it's it's with the Transportation Alliance at 8:30 if you wish to go. Uh, with that, uh, any anything else anyone wants to bring up? Otherwise, we are going to adjourn. We are adjourned.